and welcome to The Collegium, our monthly magazine program in three parts. Cinema, State of Affairs, and our arts calendar. Hello and welcome to The Collegium, our monthly magazine program in three parts. Cinema, State of Affairs, and our arts calendar. Tonight we bring you a special edition of The Collegium with our very special guest, Audrey Henningham and the wonderful William Greaves, who is in Berlin for the Berlin Film Festival, where he is presenting his film, Symbio Psycho Taxiplasm, Take One. We're going to talk more to this great man who has contributed so much to cinematic history internationally. So in addition to staying cool, remember, you are participating in The Collegium. Welcome once again to a special edition of the Collegium, where we're very pleased to be joined by Audrey Henningham and the very distinguished filmmaker William Greaves. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Collegium. Well, it's very you. nice to be here with you. Very nice indeed. We will begin with the lady to my left. Audrey, please tell us why are you here in Berlin and what have you been doing all of these years in the United States and in Europe? Wow, you're asking my whole story. Yes, in about five in, minutes. In five <laughs> seconds, probably. Um, okay, well then, let's say in a nutshell. Yes. Um, first, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure being here. Yep. Um, it's wonderful what you're doing here as well. Okay. Um, the second question is, um, what am I doing here in Berlin? Mm -hmm. Well, I did a few years ago, or let's say a few hundreds of years ago, Bill, yeah, a film with, uh, with Bill, yeah. and um, the film is Symbio-Psycho-Taxi-Plasm. Right, correct. Yes, thank <laughs> you. It's a mouthful, isn't it? Anyway, um, and this was shown at the, at the Berlin F Festival, mm -hmm. and... Um, it was, it was filmed 35 years ago. Good heavens. And I saw it for the first time two days, two days ago. Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. And I was, I was astounded that for 35 years ago, a film that, in that magnitude, it, it was, I mean, it was mind-blowing. Yeah. It was really mind-blowing. Good. Compared to what they've made today. Because this is where he was at 35 years ago, is where we're at today. A man ahead of his time. A man really ahead of his time. Anyway, back to myself, because Bill will have enough chance to talk for himself. Um, I've worked as a model. I worked at the very beginning as I came here. I worked as a, um, a speaker and a writer for Radio Deutsche Welle, Africa English. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I branched out into the fashion business. Mm -hmm. And there I was hanging out and hiding out for about seven years. And then after that, I had a cafe. Mm -hmm. And this I had also for about three and a half years. And all this time I was learning to speak German and getting the language into such a position that I could use it 
in my profession. Mm -hmm. And yes, I started working as an actress and for about four and a half years. And now I want to, now I'm at a, at a, at a crossroad okay. and I'm deciding if I'm going to continue in this area or continue in this area and do something else or do totally something else. Sure. So at this, air, at this crossroad, I am right now. Well, speaking of crossroads, let me now go to Mr. William Greaves. And first of all, let me tell you how much uh, many people here in Berlin have appreciated your contributions in terms of cinema but in more importantly, in terms of the in information and the perspective that you have brought to people who were very much in need of that information and that perspective, which had a lot to do with some groups of people with their self-esteem and with other groups of people with the opportunity to appreciate the backgrounds of people that they hardly knew anything about. We were very pleased uh, to present your film in our film festival about Ida B. Wells and of course the, the, the wonderful Ralph Bunch who is rarely mentioned yeah. although you hear a great deal about the Middle East all of the time. Mm -hmm. Tell us Mr. Greaves, how did all of this begin? What led you to become a filmmaker? Well, I can say that uh, the thing that really started me off, frankly, was my experience as an actor in New York. Mm -hmm. I was on Broadway and in television and so on. And um, I was very disturbed by the portrayal of black people on the screen and on the stage. Uh, I had been studying ancient African history and I knew that we had come from a wonderful uh, people, a continent uh, that uh, had uh, quite a long history mm -hmm. uh, that was very ancient in, character, in, in, in content. Uh, and um, it seemed to me that uh, none of this history was ever brought forward uh, and put into the school systems and so on. And um, I found that I was being asked by producers to play Uncle Tom roles mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was a pain in the neck to have to be confronted with this kind of sit situation. And uh, I became, frankly, slightly angry, you know, mm -hmm. at the distortion, at the stereotyping of African, and, uh, African people. And uh, I ended up um, deciding to go behind the camera to make movies that were much more truthful as to who we were who we are as a people. And um, I uh, have been making films for quite a while on those themes. Uh, and uh, I hope, and I, I'm happy to hear you say what you said about the uh, impact of some of these films uh, on people because uh, it means that I'm, I'm doing the right thing, you know. What, in your opinion, mm -hmm gave you the impetus to assume the responsibility that you did. And the reason I ask that mm -hmm. is because I think there are many people in the world who are frustrated with the circumstances in which they find themselves. Mm -hmm. But there's a step that you have to take to assume responsibility mm -hmm. to do something about it. And along mm -hmm. with that step comes quite often sacrifice. Mm -hmm. What is it that caused you to, to step out and assume that role to be the man, if you will. And what can you share with young people and old people who are looking at you as a role model? Um, I think um, taking on that responsibility of, of trying to alter the consciousness of people uh, as a result of uh, the films that I make, uh, it, it is a very, uh, awesome and difficult uh, uh, decision that one has to make, but uh, 
I just felt I didn't have any alternative. I just had to do it. I mean, I don't know um, whether one could say maybe I was very egotistical or I was very uh, arrogant or uh, in deciding that I could uh, make an impact with these films. But uh, I felt that uh, I was going to do what I had to do and uh, let the chips fall where they may. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I should say, uh, our films have managed to be very, very uh, effective. And uh, I'm very pleased about that. And uh, uh, any um, major impact that they have is due to the fact that I'm, I guess, blessed with the talent to, to, uh, to make those kinds of films. I'm very lucky. What is the relationship, in your opinion, mm -hmm. between your studies in acting and performing mm -hmm. and then the transition to filmmaking? Mm -hmm. How do those two intersect? Uh, the, um, interestingly, I studied acting with a very wonderful man named Lee Strasberg. Okay. Uh, and uh, at the Actors Studio in New York, mm -hmm. and when one studies with such a person and in the system of, of acting that he uh, taught, um, it expanded my consciousness, shall mm -hmm. we say, my sensitivity to what's going on around me. And, and um, as a result, uh, it has enabled me to work with uh, actors in productions mm -hmm. and understand what is going on in their minds and also become aware of how these performances are having an impact on mm -hmm. the people who are uh, uh, in the theater. Um, because I have managed to develop a level of empathy and identification, the ability to identify with people other than myself to, to uh, make sure that when I create a scene, that the scene will have a, an impact that I want to have on that particular person who is watching it, who, in the audience. Well, now when we talk, when you talk about the empathy, the 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 shared relationship, if you will, between the mm -hmm. director and the actors and perhaps the crew, mm -hmm. what has been the influence or the influences that have enabled you to create the canvases mm -hmm. that you've created with these people and with this machinery? Well, I, I think um, filmmakers, uh, directors, producers, writers are people who read the newspapers a great deal <laughs> uh, and uh, do a fair amount of reading. Um, I was lucky to be uh, a student uh, uh, studying uh, uh, with people who are very, very knowledgeable about reality, social and political reality. I had a very... Um, uh, uh, good fortune to have some very good uh, mentors in my life. I mean, people who were older than me, who had insights as to what was going on in, in society and history and that sort of thing. And I was fortunate enough to uh, pay attention. And that, if I can suggest to you, say, I'm a role model um, to any young person uh, who uh, is growing up, uh, I, I, I never really rebelled against older people. I used to listen to them and uh, take in their suggestions, their mm -hmm. observations and criticism of uh, the world. And, um, and uh, I feel that uh, I've benefited by having been attentive to these elders, shall we say, uh, I have a memory of, uh, of a barber shop uh, in Harlem where I grew up uh, that, uh, where I used to love to go to get my hair cut so that I could listen to these older people who were talking about social, political reality, mm -hmm. talking about culture, they were talking about all kinds of interesting things and I was only around, I guess, nine or ten years old and then on to fourteen, fifteen, sixteen just listening to these people and when the time came for me to become 
Then I developed to the point in my craft as a filmmaker to be the executive producer of a television series called Black Journal. Yes. I used to um, think of this black barbershop that I used to go to and make my decisions on programming of what was going to be the next um, installment of that particular series on television's network show. How I made my decision was filtering through this black barbershop in my, in my head, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, particular suggestions and uh, proposals that the various directors and producers were making to me uh, for deciding what would be on the show for the next month. And if it didn't, if the, um, if the suggestion didn't fly in my, my barber shop in, the, in my head, I, um, I would reject it. Oh, but if it did, then I would green light that particular show. And, and we ended up winning, uh, uh, being nominated for an Emmy the first year. Uh, and then also the second year, we won the Emmy for uh, best programming for public affairs and television. Right. Yeah. In the times when you were growing up, mm -hmm. just a few short years ago, mm -hmm. there is well, thank a, you. <laughs> <laughs> there is a s small difference between the means by which information is transmitted to yeah. our young people than yeah. in those times. Yeah. How do you, as the artist, the filmmaker, mm -hmm. how do you, with the changing technology with mm -hmm. the changing perhaps attitudes how then do you find the means to communicate the very worthwhile goals that you're espousing well it's it's very difficult because one of the things that's happening in the media in general um, not only uh, in America but uh, apparently worldwide is that the uh, young people are being, in a sense, programmed, programmed mm -hmm. to uh, uh, respond to uh, a whole lot of imagery and um, ideas that really doesn't serve their interests or the interests of their parents or the interests of the community or the, of, the, of the country. And this is a very sad situation, but uh, there is uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, how can I say, uh, a lot of people working overtime feeding this kind of pollution, mental pollution, into the minds of these young people. And so what you end up with, with is possibly a situation that's very unstable, society that's very unstable, and uh, uh, people even going off to war and getting killed without mm -hmm. realizing why they mm -hmm. went to war and mm -hmm. why, you know, they were making these kinds of sacrifices uh, rather than um, young people being trained and, and taught through the media to be aware about the major social political issues that are confronting and economic issues that are confronting society that need to be remedied. Mm -hmm. What would you say mm -hmm. is the relationship between the ideas that, uh, or the approaches that we're discussing mm -hmm. now, and a democratic society? How does it coincide between what one's idea of democracy might be, mm -hmm. that is having an enlightened mm -hmm. body politic, if you will, mm -hmm. and what it is that you do and at the same time with the issues that you're raising about mm -hmm. those impulses and ideas being thwarted to some mm -hmm. extent mm -hmm. by other approaches, shall mm -hmm. we say? Well, um, the only thing I can say is that uh, I try my best to um, develop uh, films mm -hmm. that I think will capture the attention of people. And that is to say, when I make a movie, I, it, it's important that that movie begins in such a way that it grabs the attention of the people watching it. And once that I feel I've succeeded in doing that, then I start um, developing 
the various ideas and themes that I think that they will uh, benefit by because I, I see a lot of my films as being not, I wouldn't say teaching experiences, but, uh, but uh, consciousness raising experiences. And so um, I'm constantly trying to plant in the minds of people those ideas uh, in my films that I think will result in them and people uh, voting in positive ways, for example, as opposed to negative ways. And it's a, it's a, it's a complicated um, process, and I just uh, think that it's, uh, it's difficult to explain it mm -hmm. uh, to you, but uh, uh, I'm told that uh, the films that we do are very educational, and, uh, and I'm very pleased with it. For example, we've just finished doing a major series of films on the life of Ralph Bunch. Actually, we did a two-hour special on Ralph Bunch and his life. He's, I, I, some people, most people, are not aware of who he was, but uh, he was the Under Secretary General of the United Nations who won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, uh, and who also was very important in the setting up of the United Nations. Well, having done the two-hour special, which was on television, we then went on to make these teaching modules, mm -hmm. uh, a half hour, 40 minutes, uh, teaching uh, people uh, about the legacy of Ralph Bunch and what actions he took as a, let's call it, scholar activist to help uh, make the world a better world to live in in terms of human rights, the conflict resolution, and all of those things. What led you mm -hmm. to the Ralph Bunch story? And could you tell us a little bit about the saga that was involved in producing the, mm -hmm. that, that film and that uh, series? Well, the thing that, the thing that led me to uh, producing the Ralph Bunch story is simply that I used to, I worked at the United Nations at one time in the mm -hmm. film and television department and I used to see Ralph Bunch on occasion walking down the halls or, mm -hmm. or either uh, in the security council meetings and in uh, the general assembly uh, and he would from time to time he, he would make notes and pass them on to various people around him and and I was sort of trying to figure out what, what, what this guy was all about. What, what is it, what's in these notes that he's passing out? And who is he? And uh, I, I, I became aware that he was, a, he was a big celebrity and was known the world over and that sort of thing. But I still didn't know that much about him and what were in those pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I got the chance to make this film, uh, I, I found out, uh, I learned actually that the Ford Foundation uh, was uh, very interested in Ralph Bunch. So I pitched an, uh, the idea of do, making uh, a film to the Ford Foundation, and the Ford Foundation went for it. And uh, I began doing the research on the life of Ralph Bunch, finding out what he was all about and so on, and ended up uh, at UCLA, the research department, of, uh, research library of UCLA, went through the various boxes of, paper, of notes and diary notes and, and uh, speeches that he wrote and so on. There was something like uh, 200 illegal size boxes mm -hmm. containing something like 3,000 fol uh, folders with these uh, documents. Um, and going through some of that material, I began to realize what an awesome person he was. Mm -hmm. And um, that ended up uh, enabled me, enabling me to make a film that was very rich in information and which uh, of course has uh, been uh, at a number of universities throughout the country and it's been on television and it's also uh, played at uh, over 30 film festivals. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to uh, speak with Oscar Brown Jr. Um, when he was here in Berlin mm -hmm. on our television program and he told the story of when the BBC came to mm -hmm. the United States mm -hmm. and they were doing a, a film, mm -hmm. producing a film on Paul Robeson 
And they said to Oscar that they were surprised when they went through the schools and through many of the places in the United States of the young people who had never heard of Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. How does what it is you do help to change that lack or that paucity of information that is with the young people mm -hmm. who are so vitally important to making some changes in the direction that we perhaps are taking? I don't know, to be honest with you. I mean, I say I don't know. That is, all I know is that I, I make these films as attractively as I can with as much information in them as I can get without making them boring. And, uh, you know, the rest is in the lap of the gods. I mean, I, I just can't, you, you can't um, really um, quantify, you can't really calculate just how much of an impact, except that when you hear someone speak, as you have spoken about our films, um, it's good for us to hear. But um, the human animal is a very uh, difficult uh, animal to uh, to uh, understand to understand whether or not they are really going to take the next step and act on the various ideas that you're you know putting into your films into the media. I was struck when I read the information when we received the Ralph Bunch film uh, about the uh, number of inquiries that you had to make to secure the necessary financial support yes. to produce the film. Sure. How often do you think it is that young people who want to become involved in cinema or the kind of work that you've undertaken, mm -hmm. how often do you think it is that they realize what it is they're stepping into? <laughs> well, I, I, it's, um, they don't realize it, uh, frankly, I don't think. Uh, because, um, you know, making movies is very attractive and, and people say, well, you know, uh, that looks so easy, I can do that. And then they go about the business of trying to raise the money and nobody is taking, you know, nobody is uh, responding. And um, eventually, through a system, I guess, a process of attrition, they are, they are eliminated because it's like climbing a mountain, you know. It's, uh, uh, eventually, very few people get to the top, uh, and uh, it's uh, very, very uh, mind-expanding for them to challenge themselves to, to make movies and do these things uh, uh, that are very attractive and so on, because we're living in this very media-conscious world. Uh, um, and uh, it... it, it, it they begin to become more, a little more humble about, you know, raising the funds. And then even when they succeed in raising the money, then the whole business of making a good film is awesome, you know, and does require a great deal of uh, concentration and, and time and energy. So that um, uh, I'm reminded of a story that Muhammad Ali um, uh, that I experienced with being with Muhammad Ali, whom I, I happened to become very friendly with. I made a movie on the first fight between him and Joe Fraser. And so I got to know Ali uh, pretty well. And um, I remember I was one uh, in, his, uh, in his dressing room there, in, his, in the gym, first of all. He did his workouts and all of that. And then um, in his uh, dressing room, uh, this fighter came in, this and, and uh, very, very strong, well-built guy, and he, and Ali said, "Well, what's on your mind?" He had, had an appointment with Ali, and he said, "Well, I'm trying. I want to have a fight with you. I want to have. I want to get a match with you." And Ali said, "Well, you know, what's it, so? What's the problem?" He says, "They don't want me to." The guy said, "I. They don't want me to to fight you." And he says, "Well, why not?" He said, well, because they think I'll beat you, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so Ali said, uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you what, uh, why don't you, uh, I'll give you a list of all the places 
that I'm going to be at and uh, this, uh, my, all my appointments and where I'll be. And, and then when I come out of these buildings, you walk up to me and you throw a punch at me. <laughs> That's what Ali told this fighter. <laughs> and the guy said, well, I don't want to, I don't want to hurt you, you know. <laughs> he said, you're not going to hurt me. <laughs> so he says, uh, oh, well, what, uh, what would that do? He said, well, listen, Ali says, when they see you coming up to me in all of these different places, there's going to be a lot of press there, and they're going to be watching me come out of these buildings. They're going to be taking pictures and things. And um, when they see you come up there and throw these punches at me, they're going to say, who's that guy in the picture? You know, who is, you know? And they said, um, he said, and uh, when you, when they, they start writing, they'll start writing about you in the newspapers and, and then the reporters and everybody that they won't give you this fight and you're going to prove that you can beat me, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> the guy said, gee, that, that's, that, that's, uh, that's a good idea, you know. She said, okay, so Ali said, you know, we'll talk to my people and, you know, they'll give you the, the, uh, the schedule of where I'm going to be. <laughs> So after he, the, the fellow left, I said to Ali, I said, why would you do, I said, you're crazy. He said, what do you mean? I said, why would you tell this man who is obviously very strong and, you know, that uh, all, the th uh, that, uh, all the things that uh, you do to win a fight? Because it, well, Ali, before the guy left, Ali told, the, told this fighter, he said uh, how, you know, he did, uh, 100 push-ups a day, you know, for his training. He ran five miles a day. He worked, you know, f four rounds in the heavy bag, 12 rounds you know, sparring. He did push-ups and, you know, he told him this whole range of things, uh, uh, exercise program that he set for himself on a daily basis. Yeah. And he said, um, and he told the fellow, he said, um, after I've done all of that, I. I get an ax, he says, and I knock down a tree that's 13 inches in diameter, you know, I chop it down. So the guy said, gee, yeah. So I, I, then I said to Ali, when the fellow left, why, 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 why would you tell him all you, did to, all you do to become a, a, a champion? He's, I said, you, you, you're crazy. He said, don't worry about it, Bill. He said, he's not going to do it. And he said, you see, he's not going to do it do the same things that I do to become a champion. Mm -hmm. He said, 99% of the people in the world don't realize what it takes to be a champion. He said, I'm a champion. He said, and when he comes into the ring and he throws a punch at me, I'm going to block it and I'm going to hit him so hard, he's going to remember everything I told him. You know, <laughs> he said. The rest of the he said the rest of the fight. He said I'm going to play with him. You know, until I decide I'm going to knock him out. You know, but I'm just saying that to say it's a long story, but it it, it tells you that anything that's really worth anything mm -hmm. in life. I mean, you've got to really be prepared to sacrifice to endure a certain amount of pain and suffering because. Uh, that's what, that's the way the world is, you know. And uh, any young person who is interested in in doing anything significant has to understand that it takes a lot of work and energy and pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's my that's my answer to you. <laughs> Bravo. Yeah. Well, let's yeah, talk yeah. a little bit about uh, yeah. why you're in Berlin now. There's a well, I'm in Berlin to show Symbiopsychotaxoplasm Take One, which is a very complex and difficult uh, film to uh, comprehend in one sense, but and one a film that's very, very funny in another sense. So I, I had a lot of fun making this film, um, and what we did was we uh, filmed. Uh, five pairs of actors doing a screen test. We're actually, we made f uh, five feature films, uh, and we had we made uh, we shot sequences of uh, screen test with five pairs of actors, 
and then proceeded to film in a cinema verite, candid camera way, a whole lot of the events that were taking place around the, 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 the shooting uh, by other cameras. Uh, so it became a film within a film. And um, uh, it was very, very um, avant-garde, very complex. Uh, and uh, Audrey, of course, was, uh, was the actress, the lead actress in, the, in one of the films that we shot. We shot five feature films. And um, uh, we didn't actually show her particular film at the Berlin Festival, which although she does appear at the end of the first film that we made, Symbiocycle Taxoplasm Take One, and then she does Symbiocycle Taxoplasm Take Two. She does appear in that in a very powerful way, oh. and it's a, it's a marvelous uh, uh, footage shooting uh, that we did for that uh, take two, which uh, we're now uh, in the business of editing that material. Uh, and Steven Soderbergh is very excited about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, he, he uh, uh, helped uh, us in the restoration of the first film that we did. And, um, but uh, he is co-executive producing Symbiocycle Taxoplasm Take Two, with starring Audrey Henningham and uh, and Shannon Baker uh, and some other people. Uh, uh, Stephen Sada, uh, Stephen Steve Buscemi is a cameraman. Do you know the actor Steve Buscemi? Uh, no, I don't. You know, well, oh, he's a marvelous actor, but he's also a terrific cameraman, and he's he was one of the people who uh, worked in the camera. Uh, uh, work uh, uh, on the film, and um, the basic situation in in that uh, symbiote psychotaxoplasm take two involves a, a man and a woman who are very much involved with each other, and uh, but they uh, had a series of arguments uh, many years ago, which we incidentally filmed. It, Just one moment, yeah. I want to hear about that. We need to go to break. So remember, you are participating in the Collegium, and we'll be right back, and we'll hear the rest of the story and talk with Audrey about her role. Stay with us. Welcome back to our special edition of the Collegium, where we're speaking with Audrey Henningham and Mr. William Greaves. Please go on with your description of <laughs> your film. Well, it's not one film, it's um, several films. Actually, we shot five feature films 35 years ago. Uh, take one, take two, take three, take four, and take five. And with the uh, first part of the uh, title, Symbiocycle Taxoplasm, take one, take two, take three, four, five. Anyway, uh, Audrey is in take two, uh, and uh, there's a wonderful uh, set of scenes uh, that she appears in, in take two, that um, are going to be part and parcel of a, an extension of Take Two in okay. 35 years later. That is to say, the, the same characters that she plays in Take, in take Two and this other gentleman play, plays in Take Two 
uh, we'll, we'll see their psychological, emotional uh, life development, you know, um, 35 years later, by some shooting that we've just finished doing uh -huh. in Central Park with Audrey and Shannon Baker. And um, that is going to be a lot of fun on the one hand, uh, but at the same time it's going to be a, a very powerful uh, film, I believe, because um, there were very interesting and strong dramatic f scenes in the scenes that were shot in take two, 35 years ago, and there are also some very strong dramatic <laughs> scenes <laughs> when she laughs at them uh, that were, took place in um, take two um, when we were filming in Central Park. And uh, Steve Soderbergh, as I said, uh, is uh, the executive producer along with me and Steve Buscemi uh, of Take Two. And, um, and um, I think that uh, hopefully that it will have a very, very strong impact on people because we use a lot of innovative cinematic uh -huh. techniques uh -huh. in filming. Well, Audrey, we've heard a little bit about your part, so perhaps you could uh, fill us in a little bit more. What exactly are you up to in this film? Um, as Bill said, um, it's getting, um, so having a, um, to, or to, let's say, not to explain, but to show where these two people mm -hmm. have gone from this time mm -hmm. to where they are now. Mm -hmm. And as Bill said, it was very, Time, times, it was very dramatic and very traumatic, if I can say the, right, the word right. Um, but this time, working with Bill, it was so, it was so exciting. It was so, it was so, it was really phenomenal because this kind of work, which we used to do years ago, which is not done anymore, Suddenly, I was confronted with this, and in the beginning, I couldn't handle it. I mean, I was ready to take the plane and come back to Germany, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we had a, a psych, uh, psychodramatist. psychodramatist, and um, it was like, suddenly, there was a, here was um, um, Alice and Shannon, Alice and Freddie, Freddie, Freddie and here was Audrey and and Shannon, mm -hmm. and there were so many things that was not um, confronted years ago, which without even knowing it, we were trying to confront it in this time, but under the name of Alice and Freddie. Those are the fictional characters. And yeah. it was mm -hmm. incredible, mm -hmm. but I must say that the way Bill handled this, mm -hmm. I, you know, I just, I said to him yesterday, um, what do you need to do another film? And he said, um, for the beginning, a million, a million dollars. And I said, well, you have here, you have the money. <laughs> he said, well, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's how excited I was with, mm -hmm. about working with him. And I would not want to have missed this for anything in the world, Bill. Really not. She plays the part of a, 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 a character, a fictional character. She plays the part of a a woman who was very unhappy in her, uh, her sexual and um, li a life relationship with this husband of hers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she, uh, when they, they separate, uh, they divorce and... Um, Are we divorced? Well, as you wish. They're either uh, separated or, or divorced. Right. And she, her, she goes into, uh, she becomes a, uh, a singer. She, uh, uh, in, in the years that go by, the 30, 35 years that go by, she becomes a singer. He becomes a psychotherapist himself with mm -hmm. the young people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of interesting uh, to see this, uh, this now successful singer who is making a lot of money and this uh, psychotherapist who is working with uh, 
kids from the inner city and mm. uh, people who are underprivileged. underprivileged people and so on. Uh, it's kind of interesting. It's an interesting combination. Uh, what, uh, and seeing the the uh, theatrical star, shall mm -hmm. we say, which is Audrey, uh, and this uh, man who is has changed considerably from the man that she was once to married to. Right. When, as an actress, and when you are confronted with a situation where that you're going right to the edge emotionally, you have to find that place to be able to portray it, whether you're on stage or on screen. How do you work that out? Um, normally, it's, um, I guess it, it has to do with training. Uh, in this situation in New York, um, I had... Because, because I said, you know, this was, again, new, new in a newer sense. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of help from the people on the set, from Bill, from Louise, um, and from my partner, from, uh, from Shannon. And we also had, as we said, there was a psychodramatist there, and she she was really helpful in a way that she she sort of lulled us into really dangerous situation uh, and with the help of Bill was able to bring us out because if, if, if that had not been orchestrated in this way as I said I probably would have left the stage or left the, um, the set. The set. Mm -hmm. From your experience how vulnerable emotionally are most actors? How vulnerable? In other words, when you have to play a scene that requires something out of the ordinary, you have to find that place in you of pain and great emotion. And quite often, uh, part of the studies that you have is you need to find an experience either that you've had or that you've read about mm. that you can utilize so as to make your portrayal as organic as possible. Now sometimes going that far inside into one's consciousness or subconsciousness mm. can be a dangerous journey. How do you find most actors or actresses deal with going to that hidden place and then having to reveal it and then come back to wherever they were or come back to a more balanced position emotionally, if you will? Um, yeah, that's a very complex question. Um, the possi the, to, to be able to, 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 let's say, to utilize the uh, infra the we have a, like we're all like program, mm -hmm. we have uh, like computers, mm -hmm. we have our completely uh, um, completed software sections and sometimes when we take these let's say we take pain use pain as a topic we take it out and um, it can be if it's real a painful situation mm -hmm. so um, depending on who you're working with depending on your state of mind while you're working, there doesn't have to, it, it, it doesn't have to be any, um, let's say, um, delayed uh, reaction to this software that you use in order to get to this point. Uh, but if, let's say, if you're um, in, in the moment you're doing this, your own private life is a little bit not quite stable, then this could be a problem. But with, as I said, with the time and with the routine and with um, practice, you're able to, to handle it or not. How does a psychodramatist, or how do a psychodramatist and director work together? How do they coordinate their mm. efforts so as to make an impact upon the, the subject? Well, the, the, the whole uh, idea is to get the actor's instrument, acting instrument, in a high degree of sensitivity and, and um, uh, 
rise, what we call emotional risability, mm -hmm. uh, so that the, it, the actor's instrument becomes a very spontaneous, uh, impulsive, responsive uh, instrument, which the psychodramatist can rummage around in the psyche, mm -hmm. shall we say, or the psychology of, of, of uh, the actor and the, and the actor's past experiences in some way that are analogous to some of the elements that are in some of the play, the, uh, that are in the scene. Um, if the psychodramatist can get the actor to um, emotionally engage him or herself in that particular uh, memory of a particular psychologically uh, sensitive or disturbing situation. If the, if the psychodramatist can get the actor to enter into that area, the actor becomes very much uh, emotional and psychologically uh, alive. And so when you then, uh, from a directorial point of view, uh, suggest a a fictional situation that's analogous in one way or another to the particular event or emotional, uh, emotional experience that the actor has had in the actor's whole real life. If the actor uh, is presented with a fictional situation that the actor s sees uh, or the, the director helps the actor see as being analogous to the uh, the emotions that are in the actor's real life and also in the character's life, then the, the whole thing comes together and becomes a very um, uh, powerful moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course there are exercises that these actors do to um, heighten the, what they call the, the risability of the acting instrument. I mean, let us say they're uh, what they call sense memory exercises, emotion memory exercises, mm -hmm. affective Sensor. memory mm -hmm. exercises, in which the actor goes through various personal experiences that uh, the actor's had and, and trains himself to become uh, an emotional athlete, an, a psychological athlete, an intellectual athlete, an artistic uh, athlete, because these... Uh, uh, the uh, tools that the actor has to use in order to, you know, perform and make a very interesting and engaging uh, uh, experience. And the, 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 you can tell uh, a, a good actor by how much they're able to actually go through these emotional episodes in a way that is so engaging that you begin to identify you know, with that actor, I don't know if we've, between the two of us, we've... <laughs> That's very interesting. When is the film to be released, uh, the uh, take two and a half? Uh, hopefully sometime in the uh, summer, early summer or late summer. Uh, it's going to be a difficult film to put together, but uh, we're going to climb the mountain with it, you know. <laughs> And what's next for you, Audrey? You live here in, in Germany. What are your plans for the future? Um, right now, I have a problem with my mother. Uh -huh. And um, this, I'm more preoccupied right now with this thought that I have, probably have to go to New York. See. Because she's in the hospital and I, nobody knows um, how, how it will go. Um, I have other uh, plans, but um, I don't want to talk about them until I have some form, sure. you know. Well, we'll meet again and we'll then I'll... We'll cross our fingers. Yes, thank you very what, much. What about, what about your becoming a singer? Becoming a singer? Yes. A singer? Yes. Oh. Is this a new... Um, story that you're giving me <laughs> <laughs> no it's a, it, we, we talked about the fact that you you're um, uh, you have this wonderful voice oh you're it, wonderful that, thank no, you no, very that, much that's a voice that uh, uh, could be a very effective uh, singing voice uh, uh, and I, I honestly th i think you're the only person that thinks that 
I mean, I've been known to, to, to have um, big, um, uh, whatever, to empty them because I, I was singing. <laughs> yeah. Empty who? Empty the, he has a soul, horns. Did you sing in that cafe that you had? Uh... No, but, it, no, occasionally a little bit uh, fun. But I sang in the, uh, in the university in Cologne because somebody said, you know, you have to sing. And I said, sorry, I can't sing. And he said, yes, you can. And I said, don't do that. And he had me on the, on the program. And uh, then he called me up and I said, you know, I said, you must be crazy. But I went up there and I said, but I've got music. I've got music. And people were looking and, you know, like, and I just kept on in the same, mm -hmm. and after a time it was like, is she real? Is she going to continue like that? And then he was looking at me and say, and I was singing and he was, okay, <laughs> okay. I said, should I stop? He said, yes. <laughs> that was my singing debut in Germany. Well, I, well, I still think that, uh, You'd be a terrific singer. You're such an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, uh, we would like to thank you, Audrey Henningham, for coming to visit us here on the Collegium. This was my pleasure. It thank was a very, very great pleasure indeed. And I mean, what you're doing is, ow, is also very, ow, is also very, very informative and very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. William Greaves, it's a I pleasure. Was, I was blown away by the toughness of those questions of yours. Who <laughs> <laughs> gave them to me? Well, my wife, well, um, I'll have to Talk deal with her later. <laughs> but uh, I must say that uh, this Fountainhead organization of yours has been one that I have followed over the years. And it's just uh, so marvelous what you folks are doing. And I, I share Audrey's uh, feelings about you and about the, the work that you're doing because uh, it's nice to know that the people of Germany, uh, uh, people uh, here in, in Berlin are be getting a chance to learn about the African-American experience and to learn about the, the, Af the African experience in general. Yes, indeed. And uh, it's, uh, it's mind expanding and hopefully uh, you will prosper more and more as you go along. I can only say that no matter what happens uh, in the future, uh, those of us who do this work have been granted great gifts. Mm. I don't know from whence they've come, mm. but we're very appreciative mm. of the opportunities that we've had mm. to do whatever it is that we're doing. Mm. And we will continue. Hooray for Hooray Father. Hooray and good. congratulations, <laughs> really, Thank you. really. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, that wraps up our special edition of the Collegium. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you the next time.